Exponential Medicine 2018 wrapped up this week. Let's take a quick look at the top 50 interesting ideas from the week. If you're interested in any of these, the full uh, presentation summaries and slides that I had written earlier in the week are available on the blog post if you're looking to actually find the source material. We'll just go through the 50 top conclusions. Number one, if AI can replace your doctor, AI should replace your doctor. This is the new mantra. You know, if we go back several years ago, the mantra was um, AI is going to completely replace medicine and doctors. And then that got shifted into saying that AI is going to augment physicians and healthcare. And uh, what I'm seeing now is the new trend is that if your physician can be replaced with the algorithm, they probably should be. This is the evolution of how people perceive AI and healthcare interacting. We saw number two, uh, I didn't realize there's actually 13 different FDA approved algorithms already out there in the last year. Number three, machine learning is being used to schedule operating rooms, booking patients based on their specific patient attributes. And this has resulted in freeing up 30% of OR time. Number four, Machine learning is more accessible than I realized. The folks at fast.ai uh, convinced myself, as someone who's mathematically illiterate, that as long as you have a uh, base knowledge of programming, you should be able to work with some ML models. And they're making strong direction and trying to make the field much more plug and play and accessible to even more users. There's, of course, a bunch of other AI news in the last year but we'll move on to the next section on life and health extension. We see from human longevity, the combination of full body MRI and whole genome sequencing can result in 14% of directly actionable findings, such as cancers, aneurysms, AFib, and 40% of all patients, and these are healthy patients specifically, um, end up having a finding of long-term value and there is an estimated one to nine years of life which are added to the health nucleus clients. Number six, the focus is now not on just anti-aging, meaning slowing aging, but actually on de-aging, meaning becoming younger. Number seven, the WINT pathway, the WRT pathway, is in human clinical trials with uh, stage one and two, and they're gonna be moving into stage three in 2019. Manipulation of this pathway is resulting in cartilage regeneration, tendon repair, and reversal of dementia. Number eight, melopsin is the blue light sensing protein responsible for the circadian rhythm, discovered about a decade and a half ago. Don't mess with it. Number nine, eating outside of a 10 to 12 hour window for rats has dramatic negative consequences on their health. Eating within a 10 hour window reverses disease in rats. Uh, Number 10, physical forces in cells such as mechanobiology affect how the cell actually uh, behaves and can mean that it will either be oncogenic or potentially not. We move into the next section on genomics and cellular biology. Number eight, the NIH DNA sequencing cost graph, I have been reading wrong for the last several years. In fact, I didn't realize that the downward sloping linear line marks Moore's law and is following already an exponential decline. The second curve, which is a steep drop around 2008, a deep scoop coming far uh, outpacing that linear Moore's Law line is actually outpacing the exponential decline in how much the price of genome sequencing dropped. New term, number nine, de-extinction, which is, uh, not, which is uh, for instance, retrieving DNA from ancient mammals, such as the moa bird or the woolly mammoth. Think Jurassic Park. Number 10, 
the value extracted from analyzing DNA is now more worth more than the cost it is to sequence the DNA. And this means that there's going to be massive growth in companies built on DNA analysis in these coming years. Number 11, viruses for dogs are very easy to customize and build online. And next up will be mail order custom viruses for humans and all the biosecurity threats that come with this. Number 12, by 2020, half of all newborns in China will be genetically sequenced at birth. And number 13, eugenics seems to be back in vogue from what I can tell. We move into neuroscience. Number 14, there's surprising advancements in being able to read and write brains. Number 15, in we are moving beyond implanted deep brain stimulators to optogenetics, which is the use of light to trigger the brain, to then non-invasive techniques to be able to write and manipulate brains. Number 16, work being done in telepathy. Yes, they are working on trying to do brain-to-brain -brain and brain-to-brain-to-brain-to-brain -to -brain -to -brain -to -brain communication. 17, biofeedback from galvanic skin response can help with epilepsy treatment in resistant cases. Number 18, meditation physically alters the anatomy of the brain, and this makes the brain actually appear anatomically younger as well in patients who regularly meditate. 19, Mary Lou Jepsen at Open Water is working on a crazy fMRI-grade imaging device that she believes will have a price point of $1,000 to buy and could be worn on the body. This device will be a step towards being able to continuously read thoughts. And 20, an electrode placed into the temporal lobe enhances memory. We'll move into new biomarkers, number 21. Vocal biomarkers. We heard two years ago that using voice to can be used to detect mood and diagnose depression. Now we hear about voice being used to diagnose cardiac health, pneumonia, COPD, heart attacks, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia. Work at least being done early in these areas. Number 22, multiple new markers such as pupil response, galvanic skin response, facial, facial thermal changes, and breath CO2 are being used to understand new biomarkers of the human body. Next section, pharmaceuticals and clinical trials. Number 23, the blockchain for is now being used for pharmaceutical supply chain. This is exciting because two years ago at MedEx, people were talking about this as a theory of wh what might be done, and now it's happening. See further the MedLedger project. 24, 74% of biopharma compounds are first in class. This is an exciting area of research. 25, no.health has the goal to be the health technology validation network with being able to deploy patient-facing apps directly into the appropriate places in a patient's care pathway as required. 26, Science37 has created a complete clinical research trial platform built around the patient, and this does not require the physician, uh, the physical physician clinic or a hospital for trial involvement. We move into surgery, where at 27, surgical quality metrics will be improved and monitored much closer with the rise of robots in surgery and VR surgical training. 28, within the first anchoring suture thrown by a surgeon using tools connected to a haptic and sensor monitors, Dr. Pugh can determine the quality and competency of that surgeon. 29. Touch surgery's long-term goal appears to be in developing a real-time guidance system and map live in the OR, and it appears they're already doing trials with this. Number 30. Focused ultrasound is exploding with indications, research, and clinical trials going on for therapy in almost every body system. Move into electronic medical records, where at number 34, non-clinicians display medical data really well. And ePatient Dave showed some good visualizations by 
Katie McCurdy and Michael Morris. Sorry, Michael Morris. Number 35, Clalit won the New England Journal of Medicine Sprint Data Analysis Challenge with their calculation of individual patients' risk and benefits by choosing uh, in- intensive hypertension therapy. And this outperformed the aggregate or on average recommendations made previously in the trial, or at least it was posited that it would outperform that. 36, patient values it can be now incorporated into algorithms as demonstrated by Clalit and having patients specifically uh, weight areas such as stroke, falls, and bleeds. And this can be incorporated into the output of the recommendation model. Number 37, hospital systems have the same reasons to shun interoperability and place a moat around their data as EHR companies do. A hospital system doesn't want to lose their patients to another hospital system. And so we can't only blame EHR companies for this interoperability disaster. We move into healthcare at scale and global health. 38. It is impossible to use the current medical model in the rest of the world. This is something I've been talking about for years, and now Jeremy Howard has shown some good statistics taken from the World Economic Forum to back me up. For instance, in the presentation, a slide from Nigeria was shown, and in order to match the OECD physician levels by 2030, Nigeria would have to spend 10 times more on uh, public expenditures than they currently do in just healthcare, and it would take 300 years to train those doctors. 39, the FDA is putting the final touches on a new software as a medical device fast track. 40, WebMD has 76 million unique monthly users. 41, human avatars are looking really creepy now because they pretty much look lifelike. And these digital avatars could also be customized to uh, look as your future self, and this could improve behavior change. 42, when looking at medical data, consider which patients have been missed and which are not captured by the results. Who is missing? Often it's the patients who don't show to clinic and don't have a zip code. And these are the patients who have the highest burden of disease and really require our focus and care. 43, voice control technologies can be bought by the consumer for $40. Think an Amazon Alexa. And this is dramatically cheaper than a phone, tablet, laptop, gaming console, making this a widely available technology, and this opens many possibilities and is in part why big tech companies are battling over dominance in voice. When you look at the numbers, number 44, telehealth has been a failure. 45, asynchronous communication may be as valuable as the printing press and has the potential to transform healthcare. Number 46, 95% of urgent care and primary care can be done without in-person visits, per Jay Perkinson. And kind of connected to this is the fact that in the past, surgeons were very hesitant to use anesthesiologists because then they couldn't hear the cries of their patients to help guide surgeries. Change in healthcare is hard, including in-person visits. We move into business. 47. When companies are ranked by their exponential qualities, those with the highest, op- the highest rating outperform the S&P by several fold. 48. Alternative payment models, such as pay for, for, pay for performance, are actively shifting costs from the payer to the provider. And it seems to be working. And providers are becoming smarter about their data, tracking their outcomes, and working to become better in the care they provide. 49, some other comments. We use a push model for education, but we need to use a pull model. 50, watch out for quantum computing. There's a lot of money moving into the space and a lot of momentum in the last one to two years. And oh, we have a bonus, a VK bonus. Vinod Koshla remains on track with his prediction that 80% of what physicians do today will be done by machine. As he said, when I say machines will do 80% of what doctors do, people get upset. 
And when I say the nurses will be upscaled to do more than a primary care physician, people get happy. There we are, the top 50 uh, takeaways. I think it would be helpful to look at the original notes that these are taken from. Those posts are linked at the bottom of this article online uh, to see the, sort of the source documentation and the level of evidence for these claims. Admittedly, I, I have not looked into the original source material for these claims and took kind of the presenters at their word. Um, I suspect some of this will not pan out to be true, but even if a small percentage of these top 50 ideas happen to uh, move into mainstream in the next five to 10 years, it will be very impressive in the effect it can have in healthcare.